Um, I'm uh, Mark Herzl of American Honda Motor, and it's my privilege as the second vice president and the chair of the programs committee of your Foreign Trade Association to introduce you to today's webinar. Uh, the Foreign Trade Association has some upcoming webinars in the next weeks and months. Uh, those are going to be an update on CBP Center for Excellence and Expertise from the Electronic Center Director George Garcia and an update from uh, CBP Branch Chief uh, Carmen Perez on the CTPAP program. That's going to be November 18th. We're also going to have an event um, getting to know the centralized examination stations of LA Long Beach and how to keep your cargo moving. All three of the CES sites are going to uh, be in attendance and that will be on December 8th. Uh, we're working with the Port of Long Beach on a uh, uh, potential uh, presentation for the logistical benefits of the Gerald Desmond Bridge um, sometime in December. If you haven't yet uh, crossed it, you should and take a look. Uh, and then we're talking to KPMG about formulating a forced labor webinar in uh, January of 2021. And then a uh, another event in um, 2019, January of, of excuse me, of 2021 on uh, a blockchain. So if you find these topics of interest and you're not already a member of the Foreign Trade Association, um, to enjoy special FTA member uh, pricing for the events, we are offering a 50% off corporate and one company representative memberships for new members from now until the end of December. So corporate members uh, normally 600 are now 300 and one company uh, representatives uh, normally 300 are now 150. So to qualify as a new member, uh, there must be an at least an 18 month lapse from your previous membership or an individual who's left a company or, um, or is a member um, of another uh, uh, is also eligible for this promotion. So as our attorney's uh, friends say, you know, other conditions and restrictions apply, visit our website for more information and join today. A couple of quick housekeeping rules. Um, um, Want to let you know that all attendants, uh, we've asked that you be in uh, listen-only mode, turn off your mics and your cameras. Um, if you have a question for today's speaker, we ask that you type it in the chat box, and that way we can address it later um, at the end of the presentation, and we can also unmute people to make sure that you can ask any questions. Uh, today's presentation is sponsored by Gemini Shippers Group. If you're unfamiliar with Gemini and what a Shippers Association is and how it works, well, then you're in the right place. For the next 45 minutes or so, you'll have the pl pleasure and privilege of uh, the 47 plus years of supply chain wisdom and experience of Mr. Stephen Hughes. Previously in leadership roles uh, with the BCO and an automotive aftermarket company, today he continues his influence through his company HCS International, where he is the representative for Gemini Shippers Association to the automotive industry. Stephen is currently the chairman for the Import Vehicle Community for the Auto Care Association, chairman of the Public Affairs Committee for the CAWA, and is a former executive board member of the Foreign Trade Association. He has led three industry, industry coalitions on anti-dumping investigations at the International Trade Commission. He served on the Automotive Industry Trade Advisory Committee for the Department of Commerce and the U.S. Trade Representative's Office. I first met Steve about six years ago when he represented the automotive industry regarding the, the ports and ocean transportation issues and worked with him in the coalition at the FMC against the unfair application of demerge and detention and another coalition regarding regarding unfairness of peer pass. So in addition, Mr. Hughes has testified to the FMC on the, the demerge and detention issues and worked with him also on the uh, FMC supply chain innovation teams with uh, Commissioner Rebecca Dye. Uh, he's well known and respected in industry and we're lucky to have him here today. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you very much uh, for the invite uh, from the Foreign Trade Association to, uh, for the opportunity that is to give this presentation. And uh, so we've, I've got a lot to cover uh, today uh, and I'm going to cover more than just the cause and effect of the soaring spot rates. Um, I'm also going to cover some of my thoughts on supply chain. 
strategy for shipping and overall steps to be better prepared for what the future may hold. And uh, uh, so many of our audience members have heard me go on and on over the years about shipping, uh, ocean shipping regarding its effects on operations and profitability. I bring this up because its importance within a company is quite often underestimated and its effect on margins, quite frankly, seems to be lost on many. However, however in unprecedented times like these, the, aspect, the effects of spot rates, space availability, and the smooth flow of parts and cargo are massively disrupted. And unfortunately, disruption has been a common theme over the past several years. Uh, for those of you that may have forgotten, let's look at the disruption and its effects we've seen over these years. In 2014 and 15, it was the ILWU contract negotiation that sent everybody's supply chain into a tailspin. In uh, 2016, it was the Hanjin bankruptcy. Uh, don't even like to reflect on that. 2017 and 2018 brought massive issues with space and rates due to the, um, the chaos caused by tariffs. 2019, we saw the implementation of the IMO low sulfur fuel mandate, which other than sowing confusion in the market and giving carriers another avenue to, to uh, confuse the BCO, it was somewhat quiet in comparison. And now we're in 2020 and uh, we've got the biggest disruptor of all to hit your bottom line, COVID. So basically what I'm saying, there's been a significant disruption to shipping and supply chain five out of the last six years. So if you think COVID will be the last ocean shipping disruption you're going to see to affect your supply chain, you're sadly mistaken uh, and, and you're not looking forward. The contract between the ILWU and PMA is up for renewal uh, July 1st, 22. Uh, those negotiations will probably prove to be the most difficult in memory due to new demands from the ILU, ILWU to stop automation at the ports. This will probably start to hit the supply chain at least six months in advance of the contract date and might go far beyond that. My point is this, it's incumbent upon the logistics, ops and C-suite to focus on their ocean shipping for both short-term and long-term stability. Those companies that have solid contracts and relationships who work closely with their carriers will see a majority of their cargo move under their contract rates even during times like these, if they've built those relationships. Those that don't are gonna suffer the dramatic spikes in spot rates and difficulties of finding space, which is killing their bottom line every time we see disruption. So again, it's, it's my point is you need, to, you need to plan ahead. You need to have a solid logistics department running, running your uh, program. So um, I'm going to use several uh, acronyms through the presentation today. So here's a short list of the, of the few most common. For those of you that are interested, I have a very compre comprehensive list I'm, I'm happy to share. For those of you that know these, uh, these definitions, please bear with us for a moment. So uh, 20 foot, 40 foot uh, containers commonly referred to as TEUs or Ts or FUs, Fs. BCO, whether it's imports or exports in, in ocean uh, logistics, that refers to a BCO, that's, that's you, the shipper. Uh, we all pretty much know what an MVO is, 3PLs, freight forwarders. The new one to the group, or not so new, but maybe the more unique uh, or niche program out there uh, is a shippers association. So a small plug for Gemini Shippers Group here. Shippers associations are comparable to a buying group for ocean freight. So joining a shippers association allows BCOs of all sizes to leverage their member volume, the member volume of the shippers association to get very, very competitive contract rates. And I'll, I'll uh, go into this much more in detail later uh, in the uh, presentation. So um, spot rates and contract rates. So what is a spot rate? Spot rate, uh, to understand that, we have to understand the contract market first. Contract rate is the price a carrier and a BCO agree on to move the company's freight in a set shipping lane over a set period of time. 
contract timing and length is May 1st through uh, April 30th the following year. But that's a more, more common uh, time frame. A spot rate is a rate on the supply and demand market. When there's a lack of space on ships, the spot rate is almost always substantially higher than the contract rate. Historically, playing the spot rate market may, uh, when rates are low, uh, can save you money. However, if you've negotiated competitive contract rates, unless you're watching the spot rates very closely and willing to put in that extra work more often than not, and in the long run, it's just better to stay on contract. So the effect of spot rates. I'll be referencing the Asia base ports, which include the major ports in Japan, Taiwan, China, Korea, Malaysia, and Thailand. So spot rates from the Asia base ports to the West Coast for a 40 foot container have reached $3,865 in recent weeks, which were sporadic reports of over 4,000 actually. So that's almost three times what the spot rates were in April and, and three times what the average contract rates are right now. Um, for uh, the East Coast, a 40 foot container has reached 46.22, almost 175% increase since April. So some companies out there might think that since this applies to everybody, it's a level playing field. Well, I wouldn't be so quick to make that assumption. So for, for those importing low margin, high volume commodities, this is a critically impacting, this is critically impacting margins and profitability. No matter what your position, think about your competitors. Are they managing their freight rates better than you? So let's, let's take a look at this, at this chart here. Um, by the way, all these assumptions that I'm looking at here are not taking overhead into account. When you do that, the example will be even more extreme. So if you look on the far right-hand column, the 40-foot uh, FEU uh, contract rate, I've just used an assumed invoice value of $40,000. So the ocean freight at uh, current contract rates, uh, based on negotiations from uh, that started from May 1st, that is, contracts that started from May 1st, is $1,420. So that makes a 3.6% uh, percent of your freight uh, against cost of goods. Now assume a gross margin of 33%. Again, these are just relative terms and relative to whatever your numbers are. Landing cost of goods uh, are $41,420 and you've got a gross margin, gross profit before overhead of 31%. Now take a look at those, the same thing on the spot rate. 40,000 is your invoice value. Ocean freight is $3,865, which re represent freight as a percentage of cost of 9.7%. Now look at what it does to your gross profit. Your profit's just gone, gone to 26.9%. That's a 4.1% loss in margin before your overhead. So at the same time, that's a $2,445 loss per container. Now, if you've moved 35 containers, that's a loss of $85,575 to the, to the bottom line. Because there's no filter. Even when you put, it, put in the overhead, that's direct loss. So... What are the causes of these rate increases? I mean, there's, there's a whole range of costs or, or causes, if you will. Um, first of all, let's get a sense of, of how much it has increased. The import surge has, has resulted in a 20% year over year increase in capacity to cope. In some recent weeks, capacity was 30% higher than last year. And this increase in capacity is said to continue for the rest of 2020. So, this is, this is basically forecasting where we're going. With that in mind, how did, how did we get to this, to this point? Well, think about how the retail market has changed. Um, how much are you personally buying from Amazon, Walmart, Target, and in online in general compared to 12, 12 months ago? 
brick and mortar businesses have seen a huge change in direction for their business and e-commerce has exploded as a consequence. And then as businesses opened from their COVID related shutdowns, retail sales jumped, resulting in inventory significantly declining and causing stock outs. Consequently, what we have is retailers and e-tailers are continuing to ramp up imports to restock their inventory that's been depleted over the last few months. Plus, don't forget about the huge influx of PPE and medical supplies we're also experiencing. And this isn't just limited to retail and medical. Um, during a recent conference of the Auto Care Association, the overwhelming theme in all of the meetings I was present in was how sales we're going through the roof and how everyone is scrambling to get product back on the shelf. Even in the discretionary spending uh, area of the high performance industry. And this is usually an industry that when we, we run up, up against uh, economic hardship or uh, tough times economically that is, discretionary spending drops. But even the high performance industry is booming. It's, it's, it's crazy, my, uh, my best friend's company sells high performance electronics and his shelves are empty. He's scrambling to get things uh, on the shelf. And don't forget uh, another uh, 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 part of this problem is, look at how much air travel has stopped. The amount of space under the belly for shipping other goods other than luggage has dramatically reduced. So you've got a lot less space on uh, air cargo too, unless they're just throwing planes up in the air just specifically for cargo. So, uh, could you put your mic on, on mute, please? Apparently, you made an appointment for us at 30. So, excuse me, could you put your mic on mute, please? Thank you. Um, so, uh, now consider this, and this is a problem with everybody. This is a problem with retailers, with, uh, with wholesalers, with the automotive industry, virtually every industry out there. The problem everyone is now facing is how do you forecast your, your purchasing going forward? We, we had months where nobody was selling anything. So inventory was sitting on the shelf. Then all of a sudden, the market starts to open up and everybody starts selling. And now there's a mad rush to get product back on the shelf. So how does, how does the supply chain professional, how does the purchasing manager, how do they look forward and say, how much do I order? What, is, uh, what are our sales going to be? With the, fl with the fluid um, uh, situation we have with COVID and all of the, the domino effects of COVID, it's extremely difficult to, uh, uh, to predict. Um, so that's one problem right now. And, and one theory right now is that um, the consumer demands uh, can't continue the, the way it is. Um, the thought is that it's going to continue, uh, depending upon whether there's a relief package or not, it's, it's going to continue through the fourth quarter and then it's going to start really softening in Q1. So another one of the uh, issues that uh, has caused this uh, big surge, which is pushing up the freight rates, is the U.S. imposed tariff exclusions expiring. Plus, we had the Moon Festival uh, and multitude of other uh, issues contributing to the surge in imports. So, and last but not least, another major reason, and well, it's, it's really what's going on with these high freight rates, is that the ocean carriers themselves are the cause of this. After decades of flooding the market with excess shipping capacity and an inability or unwillingness to control themselves uh, with, uh, with capacity, uh, they were driving uh, shipping rates extremely low. The, the carriers fin finally have caught on to the concept of market-driven capacity control to keep their rates high. In other words, it's inventory control. When there's a glut of product in the market of a high demand product, typically prices go down. However, when the inventory is strictly managed on a high demand product, prices remain stable or even increase based upon demand. That is what we are seeing in the ocean shipping industry. Self-control by the carriers and the resulting capacity constraint 
are a critical driver for these high rates. In other words, by efficiently managing their, their capacity and dealing with the surge, they've driven spot rates to their current, current levels. Plus they're, they are running out of capacity, which is also uh, uh, helping them out or uh, adversely affecting those spot rates for us. And the current consensus is, and I think the, the carriers have really learned their lesson from years of, of overcapacity of space. Uh, I think the current consensus is that carriers are not going to go back to a, a rate destructive mentality when it comes to releasing capacity. So who's affected? The terminals, the stress from the unprecedented surge in imports, uh, the capacity controlled by the carriers, uh, logistics issues related to the uh, alliances and a drop in exports has led to a logistical mess at the terminals. The large volume of empties stranded at the terminals has exacerbated flow in and out of terminals. Um, and this, is, this has resulted in BCOs having a difficult time getting their containers out of the, the, out of the terminals before the free time runs out, resulting in BCOs having a difficult time uh, with uh, even getting their empties uh, accepted. The result is a repeat of the problem we've seen time and again at the ports where BCOs are being unfairly charged for demerge and detention when circumstances are beyond their control. This has become so out of control that a co coalition made up of 40 plus trade associations have sent a letter to the Harbor Commissioners and Port Directors in LA and Long Beach recommending change. But it's, it's extremely frustrating that we cont continue to see these issues when we as an industry have pushed along with stakeholders across the country for these very issues to be addressed. Given that the terminals and, uh, and carriers now freely admit that the demerge detention fees are an important profit center for them, it's not a surprise that they are loath to resolve these unfair issues. But it, it, to, also to be fair, it is a nightmare for them. You know, they, there is their was a drop in the number of ships that were returning back to Asia uh, to keep the flow of empties uh, uh, going back. So we did, we, the, the terminals are very, very constipated right now. It's, it's starting to resolve itself, but there are still, there are still challenges. Uh, container shortages. Uh, there's been reported shortages in Shanghai, Singapore, Port Klang, uh, just among a few of the Asian hubs uh, facing a growing shortage of container equipment. And, and lower availability of containers uh, has caused issues uh, because of the increased demand of cargo ship from the region. So you've got another problem on that side. Um, and again, this is uh, exacerbated by the fact that the terminals in the US are choked by empties that are still, there's not finding their way back to their home ports quickly enough. So what other effects do we have? Small parcel freight, UPS and FedEx, uh, both are implementing price increases. Uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, comments I've had from some of my clients has been these, these, uh, these cost increases have been uh, basically almost strong-armed uh, by the small, the small parcel carriers. Uh, I've heard uh, that when somebody complained uh, about these new rates, they were told to try the competition if they didn't like it. Uh, so FedEx and UPS uh, definitely have a, a um, strong position right now. Uh, trucking rates, FTL, LTL. Um, I have heard recent uh, uh, stories from my clients of trying to move a container from west coast to east to uh, to midwest costing nine, nine pardon me six thousand dollars to the midwest and upwards of nine or ten thousand dollars to the west coast or to the east coast sorry um, and rail if you've been following the news there's uh, surcharges that uh, UP and uh, BNSF have uh, started to implement um, on the smaller smaller companies so, what are our shipping options uh, and, and the pluses and minuses uh, 
that you would find from uh, using these particular uh, options during disruption. Again, what I've said before is if you've got your contracts, if you've got the relationships prior to, uh, you know, long-term uh, relationships, it really helps during these dis disruptions. You may get uh, some issues that you do have to deal with, but if you've got a solid program, it makes it easier somewhat. So an NVL, this is uh, for the small importers and especially for LTL, this is the way to go. Uh, small importers, uh, it's easy, it's convenient. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily the most cost-effective way to go though. Uh, um, but it's an all-in-one package that uh, is attractive to many companies. Carrier Direct, uh, this is, requires a, a reasonable amount of volume to grab their attention. Um, you're talking uh, a minimum of about 200 containers for them to even talk to you. But even so, um, it, you may feel it's great to be dealing direct with a carrier, but the problem is when disruption hits or peak season hits, if you're moving 200 containers and uh, they're dealing with the Walmarts of this world or smaller companies that move 10 or five, five or 10,000 containers, you're gonna be at the bottom of the list when it comes to customer service or preferential treatment. Um, Shippers Association, uh, as I mentioned before, this is a great solution for all size companies. It basically gives you the flexibility of an NVO but you get the beneficial pricing stability and visibility of a large shipper. So uh, a shipper's association, again, a commercial for Gemini uh, uh, at this moment, uh, Gemini Shippers Association, which is actually a nonprofit. It's a 501c3 uh, nonprofit uh, program. Uh, there's no upfront fees. There's no membership fees. There's no annual fees uh, or initiation fees. Uh, so there's, there's no cost to, to becoming a member. And, the, the great part about this is, is as a member, uh, because the Shippers Association negotiates rates based upon this aggregate number of container ships by, sh shipped by its members, they get extraordinarily low rates. And those rates are passed on to members via a contract number that allows the member to work directly with the carriers. So you get the advantage of being carrier direct because you have that contract number that you're getting these great rates but there's no contracts to sign. There's no minimum quantity requirements required. And the association negotiates all rates. And from my perspective, when I was at Centric, I would spend between two and three months going back and forth between a half a dozen different major carriers to come to contract rates for the season. Um, this is a much easier solution. They do all the, uh, the negotiations. And again, there's no contract to sign. So it's, it's a really nice um, option for people. Plus, when you come to problems caused by disruption, caused by these various issues that we've seen through the years, when you've got a long-term relationship with a carrier or you're working with the Shippers Association and they have this, this um, relationship, uh, an example right now for us, we're shipping them between 90 and 95% to contract rates. So that's a very high percentage of, of uh, uh, hit rate, if you will, on, on staying to contract. And think about the example I gave a few slides back of how much it costs you just to ship, how much extra it costs you to ship 35 containers on spot rate. Imagine if you're doing 100 containers a year or 500 containers a year, and you can ship 90 to 95% on contract, even during disruptive times like these. That's the advantage. So again, one of my big points is being proactive, not reactive. Um, and right now it's really critical um, to add at least two to three weeks to your shipping schedules. And one of the biggest mistakes people make is they think that, oh, we've, we're booking two weeks in advance. No, that's a bare minimum. You, uh, whenever you can, it's always a positive to book much further in advance. It, uh, uh, it makes sure that you get on that ship. Also, again, being proactive, not reactive. 
you need a professional running your, your uh, logistics department, not a clerk that you may have um, promoted uh, from another department or um, moved from, from uh, a purchasing clerk over into logistics because you think that they know about logistics. It's, that's a, it's, it's not a great move. There's a lot going on in logistics. So um, supply chain, I'm not gonna spend much time on this. I'm not gonna read through all this stuff on the left. Really what I wanna just talk about is about value proposition and how the international logistics uh, uh, sit in that value proposition within the company. So think about um, your company is, has your product category, has your, has your product, if you will, uh, and you, you invest all this money in your sales department to sell the product. You invest a tremendous amount in, of money in your purchasing and procurement and vetting out your suppliers and manufacturing. Then there's your logistics department. Then there's warehousing. There's a tremendous spend there. There's a tremendous spend at domestic logistics. Do you spend as much time or does your management spend as much time and focus on logistics as it does the rest of these departments? This is really critical because your logistics department is making everything work to have a clerk or to have a uh, bare minimum staff or bare minimum support or even bare minimum of respect for the logistics department is a huge mistake in your supply chain. You need to treat the logistics department with a collegial and customer style relationship between, between the various uh, departments. And I've found very negative uh, um, uh, relationships between these departments before. So it's, it's really uh, helps out a lot. Uh, with your whole business by supporting your logistics department properly. <clears throat> so correlating the news, how does, how does the latest news tie into our conversation? Information is vital to your supply chain understanding, its decisions, negotiations, and equally important planning from risk mitigation. Current shipping and terminal issues, labor issues, carriers and alliances, contract and, and spot rates, how is your team taking this information and using it to predict and hopefully control your supply chain, especially during disruptive times like these? Or as I said, is it? So here's uh, courtesy of the Journal of Commerce. Here's the latest news. Just look at these headlines. If your logistics department, if your supply chain professionals, if your management isn't aware of these, just the headlines alone, they're missing a massive uh, amount of information that is affecting the very lifeblood of their company. Just read through them. Demand surge intensifies container shortages. Container pricing Trans-Pacific eastbound. Trans-Pacific container lines boost uh, uh, capacity. Retailers increase forecast amid uh, import deluge. Carriers throwing capacity at lanes. Uh, imports flood LA Long Beach. A uh, high level of cargo rolling at Asia hubs. LA Long Beach congestion expect to worsen as record imports arrive. Chassis, chassis shortage in LA Long Beach likely to persist into 2021. If your logistics department is not reading this, if they're not up to date on this kind of news, they're reactive, not proactive. If they're not pushing this, to the C-suite and upper management to make sure that they are aware of what's coming up, this is a mistake. You never want to blindside senior management in any way. So I, I cannot uh, impress the importance of this enough of staying ahead of the news. So uh, let's have some final thoughts here. Um, can we expect rate normalization in the short term? Short answer is no. Uh, I would not expect, based upon the news, based upon what we're seeing, um, we're not gonna see any normalization uh, be, uh, at the end of the year. Um, we're going into, into uh, Lunar New Year, into the Chinese New Year, if you will. Um, so 
Christmas rush and retailers catching up on low inventory may start to slow down a little bit towards Q4, the end of Q4, but you're going to start to see the panic buying or the, the, the rush to get uh, goods in before Asia closed down for the holiday. Uh, so you're going to have space constraints. You're going to have spot rate high through that area, through that uh, probably uh, until I would say late February, early March. Uh, and that's maybe when we'll start to see some relief on space. And depending upon how the carriers uh, manage their space, we may start to see a softening of spot rates and a uh, return to more sustainable levels. Although I will say I would expect that the extremely competitive uh, uh, freight rates that we've seen over the years, uh, if the carriers maintain their restraint, I think we're that's going to be a thing of the past. I think we're going to see a little bit higher rates going forward, as much as I hate to say that for, uh, from the supply chain side. Uh, best sources for staying up to date on ocean shipping news. Uh, my, my preference is Journal of Commerce. It costs 360, I think it's $365 a year. Um, one story alone will offset that cost. Um, just thinking about those headlines, uh, uh, $365 a year for that kind of information, if you, if you read the headlines alone, is cheap. I highly recommend it. At the second, the, the other one that I highly recommend is the American Journal of Tra Transportation. Between these two, you get a lot of information. Uh, by the way, also on JOC.com, they've got a rates uh, uh, page so you can look in and follow the spot rates. So it's, it's quite a, it's, it's a great information tool. Again, as I just uh, mentioned, it's imperative to keep upper management and the C-suite informed. Uh, I can't say that enough. And sometimes uh, the C-suite management may not be very receptive to what you're saying. But the problem is I would rather see that months in advance than to see them get blindsided and the and the anger and the frustration you're going to feel when you have not been proactive. It's much, much better uh, all the way around. So there are three things I would like everyone to come away with today. One is that to mitigate the huge impact future disruptions can have on your business, and there will be more future disruptions as much as we like to think there won't. It's critically important to make sure you have solid contracts and relationships with your carriers in normal times that you can leverage when disruption hits. Being reactive and trying to resolve your spot rate issues or build new relationships with carriers during times like this is incredibly difficult, if not downright impossible. Number two, invest in a good, solid, educated ocean logistics person to run your department. And number three is stay ahead of the news so you can see what's coming. What's at the core of these three points as takeaways? In order to mitigate risks, it's critical to be proactive, not reactive. If you follow these three points, you've gone a long way towards being prepared the next time uh, this kind of disruption occurs. It'll save you a lot of money and make your life easier during good times and bad, believe me. Mark? Wise words, Steve. Wise words. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for those comments. And a couple of questions that uh, came across the chat uh, to me that I'd like to share is, um, are, are there any fears that the uh, carriers may um, idle ships in the future to, to help regulate and, uh, and decrease uh, capacity? Oh, yeah. It's, it's not in the future. That's happening. That's been happening a lot over the last year and maybe even longer. They, they've found religion on trying to uh, manage the spot rates and manage contract prices by managing their capacity. So it's, it's definitely happening and it will continue. And what, what about uh, in, a, in a shippers association, um, 
I, I'm wondering, is there any um, any additional guarantee of space? You know, as the capacity decreases, um, you know, it seems like it's either feast or famine, right? You know, there's there's a, a glut of of uh, space, so there's not enough space, and and when you get to the not enough space, and you talked about uh, booking early, uh, is there is there some uh, benefit that you have in in that kind of a, a situation? Well, uh, with the Shippers Association, uh, they, have, they have their contracts already booked out. They've got their space booked out so, uh, or, or, or contracted. Um, so um, if you've got that relationship with the Shippers Association and their associated carrier, um, I'm not going to name a carrier, just let's say. Right. Carrier ABC. ABC. Right. Yeah, right. thank you. You know that carrier. I know that carrier. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've been shipping with that carrier and you've got that relationship, your relationship is not only with Gemini, let's say, but your relation is also with ABC. If you've been booking solid, and I've got a customer on the, on the East Coast, they book a, a solid 15 to 20 containers a week. And they forecasted upwards of 60 to 90 days in advance. So they're really consistent. They're, uh, they're a company that can, can do that kind of predictability. They're getting 90 95% of their containers on contract rates. So it's that, it's what I was saying before, it's building that relationship. It's, it's a long-term process. You don't just think you can cure it when disruption happens and boy, uh, with some of the stuff that we've got coming, uh, you really want to leverage those those relationships. Right, right. No, sounds good. Um, are there any other uh, questions? I don't uh, see any others at this point, uh, but if you would like to unmute and ask a question of Steve, we'd uh, welcome you to, to do that at this time. While we're, while we're waiting, um, I, you've got my email address up there. If you'd like, reach out. Um, I'm happy to send you that, uh, that, that uh, list of definitions that I have on the various uh, acronyms uh, or terminology. It's, it's pretty extensive. Hey Steve, what, what do you what do you see um, with the the larger vessels um, that are coming in? You know, we're I think uh, West Coast uh, record now is what twenty two thousand TEUs. Um, you know that end to end to end that seventy two miles or seventy three miles long of containers. Um, is there? Do we see these larger vessels uh, having an impact on either the stability or the instability of of these uh, carrier rates? Uh, it, that's a that's a great question. I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, okay, um, but the the big ships have caused a lot of instability at the terminals with uh, um, with flow. Um, and there wasn't, I, I know, I, I haven't kept up on it recently, but I know that they were not retiring some of their smaller ships as these larger ships came on. So there is a lot of excess capacity um, caused by the, uh, the mega ships, if you will. Um, but uh, to your question, I'm not sure. Okay. Anyone else with any other uh, questions out there? I don't uh, see any. So uh, with that, I'm just going to say uh, thank you again, Stephen. Uh, and thank you again to our uh, sponsor, uh, Gemini Shippers Group. Um, although remember, some conditions uh, and restrictions apply if you haven't yet uh, signed up for our new membership rate for the, uh, the discount. I uh, invite you to do so right away. Uh, again, we have uh, an upcoming uh, webinar on uh, CBP Center of Excellence and Expertise from uh, the director, George Garcia, and also a CTPAD update from uh, CBP Branch Chief uh, Carmen Perez on November 18th. Uh, getting to know your centralized examination stations of LA Long Beach and how to keep your cargo flowing is going to be on December 8th. 
Uh, then the Port of Long Beach, uh, Gerald Desmond Bridge, uh, beautiful bridge, drive over it, check it out, uh, learn more about it. Um, it's, it's had a, a positive impact on the throughput of cargo through the Port of Long Beach. Uh, and then uh, Forced Labor, KPMG is looking to do an event in January. And then also uh, we're looking to do an emergency, Emerging Technologies and Blockchains event in either uh, January or February. So with that, I will uh, again thank you for your uh, participation today and uh, wish you a wonderful Tuesday. Thanks so much.